Hey guys, welcome back to another episode in the deep playthrough. Alright, let's put on the other music channel. Uh, the deep playthrough of Metro Access and House Edition, obviously. I think there used to be also music here when I scrolled this frequency in the previous episode. button oh wrong button again get damn it so annoying all right diary we were reading this we read everything and now we are in a new one summer fanatics on the banks of yeah you know what I am Stopping the radio, it's a little bit too annoying when reading. Um, anywho, god damn it, again the wrong button. Summer, fanatics on the banks of Volga, cannibals in the mountain bunker, slavers on the shores of the dried out sea. How many monsters has the war given rise to? <coughs> or perhaps were they always there and the war simply gave them a chance to show themselves and now we're stuck with them forever. Will the mere who stayed in the desert to help you lead their people to freedom beat another monster the inertia of thoughts that had been keeping the subjugated locals in willing and ready servitude to tyrants? Frankly, I have doubts. That monster might prove stronger than all the others. Regardless, we can't afford to lose hope. We are getting ever closer to our dream. Finding a place where we could live free from radiation and mutants. The maps we recovered in the desert have provided us with several promising options and now the crew members are excitedly waiting for the colonel's decision on where should the aurora go next. Currently though the train is calmly rolling eastward. The crew rests and Stepan proposed to Katja. It was a proposal she couldn't refuse. This is actually the same text that was in the previous loading screen that we already saw. But I thought to read it anyways. Alright, crew. We have some new entries. Uh, yeah, I think I already read it. Unless there are any, like new entries here. Yeah, I think there's a new section here. Man, this is quite. Uh, annoying to find out what you have read and what not. Alright, Anna, you wanted to believe me and you couldn't. You tried to not pay attention to your father and you did. The colonel firmly believes that our country is occupied and that the war is still going on and what and that makes us jumpy, makes us expect an attack at every turn, makes us make us look for traces of enemy presence everywhere he has us riled up and Anna is not immune to that she was so eager to find the occupying forces in that tiny abandoned village near the bridge over Volga that she saw an American banner in a mere old t-shirt she went to investigate and fell through the roof of an old chemical storage silo luckily the chemicals seemed to have been long since expired and Anna got away with just a few bruises. Needless to say, there was not a trace of foreign troops presence anywhere close. Already read that one. I've always been telling Anna that her father is holding on to a completely to a stupid fabrication and completely disregarding reality. But she loves him too much to fully admit that. There was no trace of government in the bunker complex under Yamantal Mountain, which the colonel was so eager to reach. Just deranged cannibals who were once workers and soldiers, but lost their humanity completely. Anna was captured by them, but I barely managed to rescue her in the nick of time. She was furious, shouting at her father, who could not believe that the war was long since over, but already seems to have forgiven him. I sincerely hope that, with the map we recovered in the Caspian Desert, she will finally manage to persuade her father that we can forget about the war and finally settle somewhere. It's time we found a new home, where Anna and I could finally live like a proper family is supposed to. <coughs> 
right, and let's read a little bit new here. I think uh, it's over here, the new section. There's one problem though, it's been a few days since we left Moscow, but we have yet to find a trace of the occupying forces. The Yamantau bunker was a huge disappointment for each of us, but, the colonel, but for the colonel what we found there was a total catastrophe. Not only there was no supreme commander there, it looked like there was none left at all. So the people in control of Metro would have no superior in this world, which meant there was no chance for the colonel to be pardoned for treason and ever return to Moscow. Not only would we have to spend the rest of his years in exile, would he have to spend the rest of his years in exile, an old cripple in charge of a few deserters instead of the esteemed commander of the order. <coughs> he used to be. It appeared that all his life, all his battles in the metro were useless. There were no signs of the war still going on, so back in Moscow our indomitable colonel simply helped a bunch of usurpers deceived the whole population of Metro, even though he was kept out of the loop. How could he take this blow and not crumble, going back to commanding us all again? I might hate his hard-headedness and blindness, yet I can't help but admire his self-control and, and courage. Courage. What the hell is indomitable? One moment. Making that a learning moment. Indomitable. Impossible to subdue or defeat. Alright, clear, one second. Even in the Caspian Desert, where most of our people were down with dehydration, the colonel persevered. He continued coordinating operations, issuing orders, and even gave his share of water to the soldiers, while continuing to search for redemption. There and then, Miller finally accepted the fact that the war was long over and there were no occupying forces. He even seemed to accept the fact that his days of glory were over with only quiet sunset years in quiet sunset years in some backwater backwater ahead the only thing he wouldn't accept no matter what was the danger his daughter's life was in outliving anna was the most terrifying prospect he has ever faced right um, one second Yet, having discovered the state that people sharing half of his blood were in on the shores of the dried up sea, the mere changed. He denied it as best as he could, but in the end the call of his blood proved undeniable. The mere fell in love with Gul and decided to share her cause. We did a lot to set his people free, but the mere's heart was captured in return. He stayed there, in the desert, because he found his true home there. While we continued on our way like homeless nomads, good luck, brother. Alright, that was a short one, nice, juke. There is no exclamation mark. Yeah, we already read it. I read this one, Euromonk as well. No exclamation marks so or nothing new, probably. Jermak uh, says, I, I just like to read this last section, that every man has a destination in life, a place where the fate, where fate leads him to. And whenever life becomes hard, sometimes unbearably so, I always recall his words. This might be the end of the line, but it is still not your destination. Get up, walk on. That's a beautiful uh, adage, I would say. 
This might not be the end of the line, but it's still not your destination. Get up, walk on. Thank you, Yerma. All right, and now it's really annoying because I don't see names anymore in the left menu. You only see a plus. So I don't know the exclamation mark that is there for which entry that is, because as soon as I go one down, the exclamation mark when you select something disappears. So it could have been for this one, or for this one, or for that one, I have no idea. That's really bad, bad um, yeah, journal design, so to say. You cannot see where, which one had an exclamation mark. It's super annoying. All right, idiots, so I just have to do it by uh, remembering. I think this is a new section. In combat though, Idiot becomes a different man. There's not a trace of his usual penchant for long-winded speeches and reflection. He is composed, quick and ruthless. It was him and Sam who saved us from the cannibals in the Yamantau bunker complex. And it was him again who interpreted the satellite data and gave us a new goal. The more the colonel glares at me, the more he relies on him. So I think that whenever our leader decides to retire, he's almost likely to leave the order or whatever is left of it by that time in idiot's hands. It's not really dem democratic, I would say. <coughs> I don't even remember Sam an idiot saving the day in the Yamantau bunker. I think Archam had a big piece in that as well. But whatever. Um, anywho, Alyosha. Nothing new. Sam. Sam would refuse to leave the colonel's side no matter what, he wouldn't let anybody else push Miller's wheelchair. Alright, I already read that. I think the last one is new. While we were waiting for the Aurora's repairs to be completed, thinking on how to cross the river, Sam, in light of our constant mentions of occupying forces, hypnotized himself into believing that the colonel didn't trust him. It must be heartbreaking to have served a commander for 20 years with unquestioning loyalty, only to be considered a traitor. But it must be equally heartbreaking to have become so close to your old enemy, only to learn that your country might still be there after all. And if the war still is going on, whose side are you on, Sam? Who are you? Yeah, that was not a new section. Already read that. All right, Stepan. Right until meeting Katja, Stepan had never defied the colonel, but when Miller didn't want to let the woman and her daughter board the Aurora, he started a real quarrel. The colonel was noticeably thrown off, while the rest of us immediately understood what was going on. Still, as any good commander, Miller quickly saw through Stepan and let himself be talked into letting Katja and Nasha aboard. With this addition, Stepan was sure to never leave the crew. For Saving her, Katja repaid Stepan in kind. In the Caspian desert, Stepan got so ill he couldn't even walk, much less fight. He almost died from dehydration, and if not for Katja, he would have been dead for sure. He knew whom to thank for his life, and as soon as he was able to get up, he immediately fell to one knee and proposed. Search wherever you can. You'd never find a better husband for Katja and stepfather for Nastya. He's been spending so much time with the girl, making toys for her and answering her constant questions about everything that Nastya had already called Stepan dead several times by that time. Now that Katja was officially his wife, beholding their family happiness was a true sight for the sore eyes. At least someone will be able to have a proper family and future. A pity this doesn't seem likely for Anna and me. Why not? <coughs> Dokarev. Nothing new here. Katja and Nasha. Um, 
This is all old. Already read it in a previous episode. It's no wonder that Kroner let Stepan and Anna coax him into letting Katja and Nastya aboard the Aurora, even though there must be numerous dangers waiting for us. I would argue that these ladies are tougher than some battle-hardened troopers. Besides, Katja is a trained nurse, and we will most probably need all the medical expertise we can get. Oh, wrong button. Katja really is amazing. If not for her efforts, our crew was bound to stay forever in the Caspian Sands. We survived in the Metro Tunnels. We won the Battle of D6. We survived where anybody else would die, but dehydration and infections of the desert had almost done us in. Stepan, despite all his strength and resilience, would have definitely died there, had Katja not nursed him back to health. It seems she would have never forgiven herself, had she not been able to. Katja herself, however, she suffered from the heat, never let that show. Driven by her example, Nastya not only didn't whine in the slightest, but did her best to help her mother tend to the sick, tend to the sick. What in the world would we have done without them? Crest. Uh, we already read the first part. Thousands of bills. I don't know if Crest will be journeying with us for long, but I'm not surprised he had such an easy time fitting in. Right from the start, he gave us the hand with fixing the Aurora. He gave us the real car he'd been using in his adventure and then went with us on a mission to capture the tugboat. Giving Duke and me the cover we needed to infiltrate the bridge. It's no wonder that even our usually cautious Kronor had no second thoughts about welcoming Preston to the crew. Alright, I will read the first section as well. I'm not 100% sure I already read it. Because I think the last time we read the journal was in Volga in the Caspian. I couldn't access the rail car in the Caspian, so it was in Volga. And actually in Volga is the area where we um, added Crest to the gang. So I'm not sure whether I was able to read about Crest in the Volga already. I think I do. It sounds familiar this first section, but for just to be sure. An avid storyteller, a talented mechanic and a natural born adventurer. We traveled all across the vast expanses of this threatening world of the surface, so alien to us. <coughs> Who'd been through hundreds of scuffles and struck thousands of deals, quite a few of which could well be of the less scrupulous sort. I don't know if Chris will be journeying with us for long, but I am not surprised he had such an easy time fitting in. Right, that was Crest, and that were all the uh, people's Yermak, I always forget his name, and Tokarev also, but the rest I have pretty much done. Then New Worlds. We read this one, Fanatics is old. Exhibition is old, Hansa is old. Alright, cannibals is new. The cannibals residing in the Yamata complex seems seem to suffer from heavy cerebral damage caused by an infectious disease they contracted through their diet. So their words are barely legible. Still they are exceptionally determined in pursuing their prey and completely disregard of their own safety makes them a dangerous enemy indeed. There's quite some uh, grammatical mistakes or typos in, the, in this journal. I don't understand why they didn't proofread this a bit better. 
seem suffer, it seem to suffer. They are exceptionally determined in pursuing their prey and their complete disregard of their safety, of their own safety, whatever. Tribals, the local population of the Caspian Desert, ruthlessly subjugated by a tyrannical criminal empire. The tribals are mostly young and serve their masters willingly, remaining servile and dedicated to them no matter what terrible oppression they are repaid for their service with. All tribals are devout followers of the cult of the Holy Flame, instituted by the Baron, their adherence to the tenets of faith being brutally enforced by their masters to keep them under control. Swarok Oil, the criminal empire ruling the portion of Caspian Desert we visited was controlled by a supreme ruler called the Baron, using the largest oil rig in the area as a seat of power. Apparently the Baron's climb to power started within Swarok Oil and an oil drilling company that had been controlling all of oil extraction in the area when the war broke out. Right, done, creatures. Watchmen, demons, human, human animals, starfish is all old. Right. Uh, shrimp female. Already done that one. Mail. Already read that one. Dog. The common dog seemed to be no match for the messed up world of the surface. Yeah, we already read this one. But they managed to survive despite being surrounded by mutants and human enemies, so they definitely are a threat to be considered. <coughs> Especially when you consider their keen senses and ability to easily alert their masters to their presence. I still find it ridiculous that you cannot non lethally take out dogs. I, I That's really one point, at least one point, from the overall score I will give this game. Spider bug mill. These dwellers of abandoned tunnels and other dark places of which there is no short shortage in our world are extremely aggressive, agile, strong and well armored, making them tough opponents. When you consider their tendency to live and hunt in packs, they become veritable nightmare fuel. Their only real weakness, although a tremendous one, is light. Even a mere flashlight can make them press about in panic and die in seconds. Yeah, that's uh, something I did not do enough. You can actually corner them into uh, a corner and then just sh shine a light on them and they should die. Spider bug female. Ah, they're male and female. These dwellers of abandoned tunnels. This is all the same. The females of the species tend to be armored even better, better than their male counterparts, but prefer to stay at a certain distance from their prey, at least until they disable it with lots of web they shoot with amazing power and accuracy. I'm not even sure I encountered those. Their only real weakness, although a tremendous one, is light. Yeah, that's the same. Yeah. I do find one of these was much weaker than the other. I think the male indeed. It says here that they are well armored, but the males were pretty easy to deal with. It were the females that were like crazy hardened. Alright, Lurker. Well, Lurker is far from being the strongest or meanest mutants around. Either in the metro or on the surface, they are still a danger to be considered. Yeah, I think I already read this. Especially for a lonely wanderer. They are a colonial burrowing species as such. They protect themselves from the larger predators by constructing lots of interconnected burrows in close proximity to each other and hiding in them is sufficiently threatened while keeping the surroundings under constant observation in search for danger or potential prey. When in a lurker infested area you can never guess which burrow a bloodthirsty creature might appear from. Though you can bet it will most often be the ones you're not looking at. Right, that are the 
creatures, all updated and red. Equipment, apparently there is nothing new. Gas mask, charger, notepad, backpack, binoculars, racer, lighter, Spartan suit. Um, One second, that can be easily configured for heaviest of engagement or reconnaissance, reconnaissance missions. When swiftness of movement becomes the main priority, right? Night vision goggles. And our standard power packs. All the helmets issued by the order have the necessary mounting points and our standard power packs, usually reserved to feeding our flashlights, have additional sockets which all the Spartans can use to plug such goggles into should they obtain one. Alright, already read that one indeed. Weapons, a new weapon. The Kalash. Already read that one. Shambler. Read that one. Tikar. I think there are some new sections here. Of course, you have to mine not just the ammo in the magazine, but also the air reservoir pressure. Though Tokarov has at least improved the valve so that the air does not escape unless you actually shoot the weapon. Besides its pneumatics, Tokarov also improved on Tikar's ammo, inventing a very effective incendiary round that can be easily made in the field out of two bearing balls, an empty ampule or a piece of glass tube a teaspoon full of fuel and a chemical initiator of course you can't fit many of these rounds into the weapons magazine but they are so effective you barely need more than one at a time all right revolver nothing new uh, one second Yes, A shot, that's the shotgun, nothing new. Still, anything. Still, anything from one to four barrels, not counting different chokes, stocks, Rico compensators, and sights even within the order the only standard as far as the shotguns are concerned is their caliber uh, again a very messy grammatical sentence I have no idea what it's trying to say I can't wrap my mind around how Tokara manages to know them all inside out still anything from one to four barrels, not counting different choke stocks, Rico compensators and sights, even within the order, the only standard as far as the shotguns are concerned is their caliber. Alright, I think they want to say that it's very customizable. Bastards. Already read that. Despite all the afflictions plaguing this gunsmith nightmare, Tokarev managed to turn it into a decent weapon with enough firepower and accuracy to take his rightful place in our arsenal. Its only remaining drawback that even Tokarev's magic was unable to fix is its propensity to jam when it operates. Still, the number of bullets the bastard, as we naturally came to be calling it, managed to spit out before it stutters usually ends up being enough for any opponent. Decoil already done that. By the way, this was not a new entry. Throwing knives, nothing new. Explosive. <coughs> um, nothing new. Molotov cocktail. This primitive incendiary device. A little more than a bottle filled with gasoline. is still a dangerous weapon if employed skillfully. Right. 
Uh, Gatling, I think this is a new entry. Despite the rate and number of components in their construction, the multi barreled machine gun guns like this creation of somebody's bothered genius have one adventure over the regular ones. They, if you have the necessary talent and industriousness, can be made out of a couple bicycle frames and the scooter engine with nothing but a thin file. A working machine gun of a more conventional scheme, on the other hand, can't really be made without decent machinery and steel. Besides, it is quite easy to burn out a conventional machine gun's barrel. Just fire a few really long series in quick succession and the bullets start hitting every, everywhere, save for at target, its target, I would think, or the target. You can't easily repeat that trick with a multi-barreled pepper box, though, as where would you find the sheer number of bullets required for that? No wonder the gunsmiths, and I think also because of the turning barrels, it cools better. So I think it's not only the number of bullets it spits out, it's also the um, swapping of barrels throughout the uh, series of shots that keeps it more durable because of it better being cooled better than a single barrel. No wonder the gunsmiths of the Brave New World started making these monsters. You can't really ask for anything better to fight or to mute it at once. Alright, and this is a new entry because this is a new weapon and also the last entry. The Bulldog didn't really have a chance to make a name for itself in the numerous wars mankind was so fond of waging before the apocalypse. Ap apocalypse. The weapons creators intended it to replace its ancestor, the venerable Kailash, yet mankind was able to neatly wrap its history up without the newcomer's involvement. So the Bulldogs started reaping its share of life only after the end of the world. I have to give the Bulldogs designers credit. It is vastly superior to Kalash's to Kalash in damage output, handling accuracy, has a lower rate of fire, making bursts more controllable, and is much lighter to boot. Yet, despite all that, you don't really see these weapons often. The Bulldog is much more complex than Kalash and requires skillful maintenance. It is hardly surprising that most of the survivors prefer its elder brother, the indestructible Kalash. All right, so it's a little bit more uh, maintenance, or it's much more maintenance heavy and probably more risky to malfunction. But on all other sides, it is um, an improvement over the Kalash. All right, that were the weapons. And I think weapons, equipment, creatures, new world, crew, diary, we read everything. So that's very nice because I am hitting the um, efforts episode duration so it is we re we heard the radio we read the whole journal we are ready to continue in the next episode <coughs> with every uh, actually something more than just reading and just on sitting on the chair guys hope you enjoyed I hope to see you in the next one for the meantime do not forget always do keep on gaming see you later